sex, drugs, murder, suicide. That's all part of growing up these days, isn't it? Those are some of the themes in the new movie, Love is the Drug. Um, my guest today, director Elliot Lester and screenwriter Wesley Strict are here. Uh, their new movie is premiering at Slamdance. Great to have you guys here today. Thank you. Thanks. So I'll see if I can find a clip. Well, I'm a weapon of mass destruction. You're two different people sometimes. Which one do you like better? Sure, come here. Go buy those two rupees off him. Yeah, but he just said. So who are these new friends of yours? Where do you work? At a pharmacy. Like a pharmacy pharmacy? Would you mind looking at me when I'm talking to you? <laughs> fucking lie to me! Say you fucking did it! Say you fucking did it! It's different than that. I wasn't human then, Mom! You know that it is. I wasn't fucking human! What did I do? Get the fuck out of here! I want to go home. Let's go see if that chick has a friend, man. I think it's late. So, you know, when I was watching this movie, it occurs to me that I think um, growing up is a little bit tougher these days, I think, than. I hate to say this, you know, I guess you know you're getting old when you say, back when I was growing up. Mm. I mean, certainly like the potential for violence, um, which you kind of touch on in this movie. You, you think that's right? I mean, it's a little bit tougher these days with what kids are going through in school and... I think there's an, a, a more of a, an immediacy towards violence and drugs and, than there was perhaps when we were growing up. Right, because... It's much more available. Mm. And there's more of it. Uh, it's, life has gotten more complicated. There's more variety of, of things to choose from, bad things as well as good things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just think it's a lot tougher because even in small towns in America, I mean, you got these school shootings and stuff. And I, I guess, without giving away too much, I'm thinking of let's say the, the closing scene of the movie, mm -hmm. um, where you're not sure who's, you know. Right. Anyway, you know, it's because I always say, you know, when I was going to school, um, the people would kill themselves. There was suicide, mm -hmm. but these days they don't kill themselves, or if they do, they generally kill a few other people and then they kill themselves. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, anyway, the, certainly the violence has got to a, a higher level. But w was that one of your intents in, in um, when you wrote this movie? I mean, were you wanting to explore those kind of themes or was it just yeah. you were telling the story or was there something broader you were getting at with this? Well, I was interested in the idea of, of doing a, uh, themes that um, I think most teen movies normally don't pay attention to. Um, you know, more serious uh, subjects that uh, generally, you know, teen movies wouldn't come near, um, uh -huh. you know, that were universal. And I, and I, from what I could see... So not, uh, not just the teen romance, the typical teen romance. Yeah, yeah, yeah I wanted to dig a little deeper and, and, uh, and get into stuff that was maybe a little bit taboo, you know, that the studios, for instance, would normally shy away from. Well, and that's the thing, too. Um, you have certainly... Um, worked on all, or written all kinds of big studio films right. and worked with everybody. Um, was this a little bit different for you, doing more of an independent type of film, or? Yeah, as it turned out. I mean, I didn't, when I sat down and, and wrote the first version of it, I didn't know that it was going to be a, an indie movie. I didn't know what it was. Um, I had written a movie called The Glass House, which was about teenagers, and that was, yes. turned, it was bought by. I did see that, by the way. Okay. Uh -huh. It was bought by Sony and, and was made into a big studio picture. Uh -huh. um, this was sort of, in a way, a sequel to that. Just I wanted to do it again, take another crack at a teen kind of melodrama. Um, and I had a new kind of idea for how to do that. Uh, Did you enjoy doing it this way? Did you have more freedom or? Well, you know, I didn't, I it? sort of handed it off to Elliot once I met him uh, about, what, a year and a half ago? Yeah. Okay. And he came along. He was, uh, you know, he, we didn't know one another. Um, the, the company that financed the movie, Alpine, had oh. found Elliot and they put us together. We just had lunch. One day, and what struck me about him was how much he, uh, how passionate he was about the the, the project. He just was uh, de obviously determined to, to get it made. So I, I kind of gave it to him with my blessing. And Elliot, you've done all kinds of commercials and music videos for yeah. people like Hilary Duff and Jason Mraz. And and Jessica, Jessica Simpson. Jessica Simpson, okay. Yeah, and it was, um, uh, you know, I'd always dealt with very small, f uh, smaller formats, uh -huh. and and trying to be able to tell a story in three minutes or mm -hmm. 30 seconds or 60 seconds and um, I'd been offered a lot of you know kind of schlocky movies mm -hmm. you know urban films and things like that and then when I was I came on to the project in, in Love is a Drug I saw that uh, 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 there was a great story and uh, I, I, and we wanted to mold that story. Wow. And well I noticed that more people 
from let's say the commercial or the music video realm mm -hmm. seem to be crossing over or breaking into films these days? Is that becoming more common and more of a kind of a oh, or, you know, common uh, career path? Absolutely. I mean, um, because you have to tell a story in, in a video and in a commercial, and it's, um, I think films are becoming, I know this sounds, might sound silly, but they're so much more visually geared, mm -hmm. so much more imagery based and story based. Also, some films are all visually geared and uh, I mean, <laughs> blowing stuff up. And, uh, it's, yeah. That's, I mean, if you look at films like Constantine, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, there's a great music video director who did that, Francis Lawrence. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually use, for, in this particular film, I didn't actually use uh, a lot of the music video techniques that you would t typically use uh, in camera. Um, I try to stay away from that and try and tell a, try and try and tell a great, great story. That's so what are some of the differences? What would you do differently for a, a movie? That way, the way I approach this love is a drug mm -hmm. was to concentrate on developing the characters uh -huh. and making sure that each character felt real and genuine. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was the first time working with real actors. You know, genuinely great actors. I think, as opposed and, to as singers, opposed so. to singers who can act, but it's a different if it's a different thing. So technically, the approach was: this is what I need to get out of this scene. This is the uh, this is the arc I need of the scene. This oh. is, and so I'm dealing with a whole different set of principles. Now, how does that work when you're a first-time director or feature film director? Um, are there a lot of people from this? Well, in this case, I guess Alpine? the smaller production. I mean, there are people standing over you, watching every move, or do you have a lot of freedom to do whatever you want? Well, this, or? Is, this is what was so strange about it. Uh, there was nobody mm -hmm. um, checking uh, to see if there was anything going wrong because things weren't necessarily going wrong. I didn't have uh, 25 suits sat behind me. Um, it, so you had a lot more freedom. I had amazing freedom, but I also made a promise to the executive producer, to Ryan Carroll, that you know I wasn't going to go over budget, I wasn't going to go over schedule, and uh -huh. the, you know the script that we, you know the, the final script was what we were going to shoot. I wasn't adding scenes, we weren't changing things halfway through the shoot. So tell them you just added a big car chase. So and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so you had to cut yeah. the car chase. I did have to cut the car chase. Cut the car yeah, chase. Okay. We did it. They wouldn't do that. But yeah, it was, we set out to, um, we didn't set out to make a very big film. We set out to make, and, it, and you've seen the film, a small, intimate portrayal. Now, now what about the cast? Um, probably the biggest name, I think, of course, is Daryl Hannah, um, who, you know, well, recently for Kill Bill and everything else over the years. Um, what about, but there are a lot of young, pretty people in the movie. Um, who are some of the other cast members? We have uh, um, uh, Lizzie Kaplan who is on a show related, and she was in Mean Girls. Uh, and uh, a wonderful actor who plays the lead by the name of John Patrick Amadori, who was in The Butterfly Effect. He was in oh, um, sure, I saw that. Unbreakable M. Night Shyamalan's yeah, movie. G.J. Uh -huh. uh, Cochona, who until recently had done some work with Jerry Bruckheimer. Oh, mm -hmm. Jenny Wade, who was on Project Greenlight this year, oh. and in uh, Monster in Law. Um, and Jonathan Trent, who I had done one film called Smile, and, and that was it. But we had a fantastic cast. I mean, I had an amazing casting director, who, Annie oh, McCarthy. Right. Annie McCarthy. Well, we'll be right back right after this talking about Love is the Drug. And we are back with Wesley Strick and S Elliot Lester today talking about the movie Love is the Drug, premiering at Slamdance. So when I um, said that you have worked, well, during the break we were talking, and you've worked with uh, Daryl Hannah um, previously. Yeah, I hired, I, did, I directed a movie uh, about 11 years ago called The Tide That Binds, uh -huh. and Daryl played um, a, a sort of white trash, homicidal, <laughs> uh, but with a heart of gold. Of course. Lunatic. Uh, of course. She did a great job. She was, she was terrific. And we, we sort of... Um, she friends. was pretty homicidal and kill Bill as well. You yes, know? that's true. Um, in fact, uh, you know, yeah, she, she sort of picked up where that she could, I picked up that, where you know? she left off in Tie the Binds, really. Because I, 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 I think I was the first director to ever use Daryl as a villainess. Um, mm -hmm. She always played um, sort of airheads and uh, mm -hmm. sexy girls and, well, and, she really and the girlfriend. Well, of course, in general, I think, too, that they do cast women more and more of the action roles these days, whereas in the past they wouldn't have. But yeah, mm -hmm. and very effectively, I think, in some but, of those cases. But yeah, somehow I thought Daryl would make a good uh, crazy person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she appreciates that, you know. I think she does. <laughs> yeah. um, well, again, you've worked with so many people. Um, Steven Spielberg. Yes. 
What was that like working with Spielberg? Um, you know, he's God, so. You just sort of <laughs> get down well, on one hey, knee. <laughs> there's a little bit of praise there. Yeah. No, it's it's great because when you're working with Steven Spielberg, you know that everything you're doing is going to happen. You you don't worry that. The movie In made. fact, you had basically turned down the project, and you still got roped oh, into it. Of Cape Fear. Oh, you know that. <laughs> it's I true. <laughs> yes, uh, Stephen uh, just. He pressured me into doing the movie. He pressured Scorsese into doing pressured it. Pressured right. Because if, if I'm saying this accurately from yeah. the interview that I read, that um, you went in and gave him all kinds of doubts that you had about the script and why you didn't want to do it. Yeah, I met with him to tell him that I couldn't do it. Uh, and, then, and then the conclusion of the movie, whereas most of these executives would probably say, get your ass out of here, <laughs> he basically said, like, when can you start, right? <laughs> he stuck out his hand. And, and well, after I spent 10 minutes telling him why I wasn't the right writer, uh -huh. and I'm trying to be very polite about it, he stuck out his hand and said, well, I'm really glad that you're coming aboard. <laughs> <laughs> and and you I know, I didn't know that. what had happened. Yeah, I was thinking about that later. I thought, God, what a smooth move, because I you probably so. don't even know how to react to that, because Not you're just all. assuming they're going to say, well, thank you, or, you know, I shook, I shook his hand th and thought, what happened? It was like a jiu-jitsu move. It was great. And you when I got home... tell people about the time that you almost worked with Steven Spielberg and he'll never talk to you again, and instead... Instead. And when I got home, there were five messages on my machine already congratulating me for my agency, <laughs> and they were already making the deal, so I was, I was totally stuck. But then I figured that's why he's Steven Spielberg. Yeah, well, you can tell that, yeah. And I think in general, you hear stories that with somebody at his level, or he in particular, you know, for instance, has no problem with casting unknown because if he see, he's worked with so many people, if he sees somebody and likes something, you know, where some people might worry more about the name, but he'll go out on a limb because he's Steven Spielberg and yeah. he can do it. So. He does what he wants. Yeah. I've done a few things with him. He, he was the executive producer on Arachnophobia, which I did even years oh, okay. earlier okay, yeah. than that. Yeah. So what was that big spider movie? Or I, yeah. Uh, it was a spider movie. Lots of people getting eaten by spiders. I'm trying I don't to think if they were eaten, they were bitten. Bitten, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah. Doesn't sound good. Yeah, it I was, mean, it was to be bitten. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in Cape Fear, you also worked with De Niro. I did. What was that like? Was that. Um, you know, Bob, was, he's, uh, he's, he's Bob De Niro, you know. <laughs> you, you have to be in awe of him. I mean, you know, in, in the script, I described that he uh, smoked a cigar, so he shows up you know, in rehearsal with a cigar like that's that big. <laughs> and luckily Marty was shooting in widescreen, but it was, you know, and then I just Sort of like Arnold Schwarzenegger, the sp spokesperson for yeah. Cigar Smokers of America or something? A yeah. little bit like that. But no, everything he, you know, that was in the script, he sort of took and magnified in a mm -hmm. way that was very, uh, it was kind of brilliant. I, I would never have had the guts, you know, to do it that big, but that's how De Niro wanted to do it. Now, when you work with somebody like him, is he um, like a pain in the ass director who uh, forces you to do all these rewrites and stuff, or does he just go with the flow, or um, I mean, what was that like? He, uh, you know, he always had a lot of ideas, um, and he would call me, and I think this is, I've talked to other writers who've worked with him, he gets a sort of bee in his bonnet, and he just, you know, he's obsessive. And I guess, again, that's what makes him who he is. I mean, he, in the script I had his character Max Cady quote from the Bible, I think, once or twice. Uh -huh. Bob liked that, so he wanted to, at a certain point he decided in every scene he needed to have not one quote from the Bible, but five or six, and then he <laughs> wanted to decide on the day which quote to use. And he would call me, leave like messages the night before, you know, where's my quote, I need the <laughs> quote, I need more quotes. He sort of stalked me. Take um, a pretty, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are biblical quotes. Or, uh, yeah, it's hard to understand. come up with, you know, the, after the first 30 biblical quotes, you start to, you know, run dry. But. Well, although I think, you know, Cape Fear is certainly a movie that people, I think, probably associate with you with a lot. I would have to say, though, um, I loved Return to Paradise, as oh, I told you. you beforehand. And I, I remember watching, you know, not having any idea, you know, at the time we wrote it, um, really just I enjoyed the movie a lot. And that was a very powerful film that I felt should have gotten Best Picture that year. Yes. And as I say, I'm telling you, I'm going to start giving out awards on this show, I think, just so I can give films the awards will that you, I will you should get. Will you at least nominate it? For <laughs> yeah, retroactively, I will. Thank you. Uh, but I, and I didn't realize at the time that it was a, a remake, but I would have to say even then, I haven't seen the original. Well, it was an adaptation, of, very adaptation. loose adaptation of a French movie. Right, because it's actually, yeah. yeah. But I was going to say, even at... It would have to be a very successful remake because it wasn't a, a Dukes of Hazard remake where you're sitting there saying, oh my <laughs> God, because, or even Psycho, you know, unfortunately where they take a classic and try to do it scene by scene, but whatever you did, you did a great job with it. Thanks. So. No, it's a, one of my favorite of my films, too. So what was it like working with this guy? Um, you know, again, you've worked with all these big actors and directors and well, stuff. With Elliot, like I said, uh, I, I said, go make the movie. Um, and in fact, Elliot brought on another writer I want to plug named Steve Allison, who did a terrific job doing a lot of the um, production rewrite. Did you have a lot of rewrites for him and send them back and... Uh... To, for Steve or for Wesley? Oh, both. I, I was very... Uh, I tried to be very respectful since it was written by Wesley, and um, at the beginning of the process I said, um, I'll, I'm going to send you um, 
the scripts drafts, and yeah. did drafts, and you can tell me what you think. And mm. Which I did. Me. And he did, graciously. But yeah, we did. I spent. So you got to give him notes instead of him I giving did, you notes. He did great, give me great notes. Great fun, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get to, to torment it. him. Yeah, yeah, but it's a, for me, it was an education. You know, I'd never sure. really worked with a screenwriter. Um, so Steve and I spent, you know, four months or so going through, taking things out, adding things in, adding characters, and, you know, shaping it up into a very good small film, which it, which it needed to be. Right. And the version that I gave Elliot was a little more, a lot more, I should say, plotty, sort of more plotty with T, uh, more of a kind of um, mystery thriller, um, more the sort of thing I tend to write. They made, you know, partly because of budget and partly because yeah. of Elliot's interest in what he wants to go for, yeah. much more naturalistic character based, et cetera, and simpler. Uh, in those, not emotionally simpler, but simpler just in terms of the physical production side of things. And I, I would say you were probably a little nervous to show, show me the movie because it had evolved. Um, but yeah. when I, I so what, what did you think when you saw it? I loved it. I absolutely, I mean, I, well, Elliot was sort of watching me watch the movie and I, and I, and I knew that he <laughs> felt, you know, a little uptight about it because he had taken my thing and, and made it his own, which, by the way, uh, that's what directors do, sure. um, especially if they're doing their job. Uh, and my concern is only, is it, is the movie working is it on its own terms? Is it a good movie? Is it, is it making sense? Is it happening? Uh, I, I could see right away that he had done a terrific job and I just sat back and uh, enjoyed it and I told him, you know, it's brilliant. It's not the script per se that I gave you, but it is, it's the movie that we all, I think, always envision. So I was thrilled by it. So, and again, it must have been very exciting for you to get to work with somebody with his background. Unbelievable. His everybody Unbelievable. Was. I mean, you know, I, it's, uh, it's, it means more when you're a fan. You know, and then you get to to work with someone as, as great as well as it was great. You know, we stayed in touch. And we want to do more stuff. And we we're going to do more stuff. Yeah. Now, what would the budget for something like this generally be compared with, you know, your big Spielberg <laughs> production? Probably it's the like catering the, budget. Exactly. I think the, the catering was, budget. The cheese was <laughs> budget. <laughs> it frees you up, truthfully. Um, you are, even though it's not a lot of money, I will say that it was the right amount of money for this thing. I mean, of course, you know, in a studio picture, you're dealing with such different variables, you know, mm -hmm. you know, in the star vehicles and, and trailers. I don't think the actors had trailers on this. They had, like, little I, You know what, I think if, if he had had ten times the amount of money and time, he might not have made a better movie. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Sometimes less is more. There's that inertia that you get from a Well, he, he made all the, um, the limitations, I think, work very smartly. We will be right back with uh, Leslie... Elliot Lester and uh, Wesley Strick right after this talking about love is the drug. We are back with Wesley Strick and Elliot Lester today talking about love is the drug. So during the break here, you guys were acting out a scene for me. You want to act out that scene? Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't human. I wasn't human. I wasn't human there, Mom. You know that it is. I wasn't fucking human. What did I do? Get the fuck out of me! I wasn't human. I wasn't human. <laughs> No. Come on, you gotta no, do your I'm part. Not. Behind the camera, always behind, <laughs> behind the, the camera. camera. Okay. The camera. Okay. Well, I think he has some acting aspirations over here. Well, he's a performer in his I was, former life. Yeah. You were uh, in a rock band, right? Yeah, in New York, uh, back in the '80s. Yeah, the sort of a new wave band. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, any interest in uh, picking that back up with the music video director here? None whatsoever. No. I think we're gonna do it. I think <laughs> that'll be, uh, that'll be the uh, Wesley Strick Elliot Lester. No more Hillary Duff, right? The, the nostalgia tour. <laughs> no more Hillary Duff. For sure. yeah. Maybe. Who knows? Never say never. Never, no. never close the door there. Yeah. So you guys are getting this out there now on the festival circuit. It's pre premiering at Slam Dance. What is that like, um, getting it out there and marketing it? And I think there are people who, you know, maybe doing independent features who want to get their own film out there. Uh, what, what's that whole process like? It's. I mean, of course, first of all, it's very exciting. But the other thing is, um, you, it, it's uh, learning as you go. You ha I think what you have to do is make sure you have the right representation and have the person with the loudest voice screaming at the top of their lungs for you, <laughs> you know, and making people aware of your, of, of your picture. And now, is that Kim, your publicist, or <laughs> is Kim's that? Kim's a publicist, uh, and also, you know, uh, our, our agent, uh, Sean Riddick at ICM, who, who's the agenting, agenting the movie, and making sure that the production company is behind you all the way, you know, and that's very important. And so, if it's premiering there, then I mean, what what's the timeline on something like that? Do you have, you know, does it take months to get it well, out they, there? You, su um, you submit 
uh, three or four months ahead, uh -huh. and then they make a decision, they let you know, and then that's when the trouble starts. And <laughs> then you have to push and push and push and make sure, and then by the time you've got, I'm assuming, because we haven't got there yet, but by the time uh, you're there, you hope you've done all your work and handing out flyers. And, and uh, do you have to, well, what is the submission process like? You just you send in the tapes and fill out the paper. Yeah, you get a piece of paper uh, and uh, an envelope. Send it back with a check, and, and, then, then, you and then that's that's it. You cannot, and this is what I really loved about submitting to Slam Dunk. You can't carry their favor. You can't mm -hmm. call them. Have a friend of a friend or something. Listen, yeah, you know, you can't call it in because you don't know who the people are who are watching the movies. There's a certain purity, I think, in yeah. the way that these programmers choose the films. And then after that, so the goal is that you hope then it gets picked up or somebody there falls in love with it and a big uh, studio comes to you and says, we want to distribute this. Ultimately, for as many people to see the film as they can, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it would be lovely. And now what do you think about, you know, these days there's so many other opportunities for getting things out there, at least certainly for television, but, you know, like the internet and all mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, is the world changing or getting easier for independent productions and distributing them? And I think there's more choice than ever. I think what might be missing because of it is a way to be able to find out um, how to get hold of those things. I think it's, a, it's never been a better time to be a filmmaker because the technology has become so much, it's that advanced that anybody can pick up a camera yep. and go out and make a movie, which is wonderful. Yep. The problem is the skill that I think you need now is in marketing and awareness. Uh huh. Yep. You know. Yeah, because you can get it out there, but then will anybody yeah, see it? Yeah, who's going to see it? choice of things. <laughs> but I thought it was interesting. You do use 35 millimeter, though, right? Because this was not digital, or at least it didn't look digital. No, no, no. It's uh, it's uh, in that res in that regard, I'm a uh, I'm a purist mm -hmm. in that regard, just because of the way um, uh, film looks over video and the. Yeah, I completely agree with you that I think it was um, well Spielberg has been quoted as saying apparently that um, you know he said he'll use 35 millimeter even if he has to go to China to get it oh, you good. know because you know, no matter what they tell you I mean I, I love all the new technology and the distribution mm -hmm. but you know the resolution and the color sensitivity mm -hmm. there is a difference no I mean I even mean, high def video does you know. not look like 35 mil and well we used to seeing 35 millimeter that has a certain look to it the film look and we all mm -hmm. I think who grew up with it anyway love love that look it's not the technology I'm sure is is gonna get there it's just not there now. Yeah. Yeah, I hope it does. I mean, it would be great, but, but there is a difference. And, um, and that's why even when they talk about digital projection and stuff, you know, I wonder what you lose. That's why I refuse to get a digital camera, by the way. Really? Everybody, and not that I'm a great photographer, mm -hmm. but I, I know that I've read enough books and I've interviewed enough people that I know that 35 millimeter is better. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to be like the last person in America with a 35 millimeter mm -hmm. still camera. You, you and Spielberg you know? will run into each other in China. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, it'll be my, my little Instamatic or something, you know, but he'll, he'll be making the movies. I'll be just taking still photos. <laughs> but, you know, because like now 90% of the uh, digital or the, the, the still camera market is, is all digital. Sure. And, uh, and did you do your own editing then, like on no, Final I, Cut um, Pro or something like that? No, I, um, I know it's a, a system that's become, um, that's being embraced right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I, we cut on an Avid. Okay. Um, I used um, a fantastic editor called Steve Reese, who was um, a music video editor. Uh -huh. And oh, well. I brought him from that world, and um, I wanted what I wanted to do is be able to work with someone who I, who I trust, and I trusted him, and I think he delivered. And so did that keep the pace then, like a little faster paced or something? It's interesting you this? bring that up because I was told um, typically you get ten weeks to do an edit, but I was you know we cut it in seven weeks. Seven weeks, which Perhaps. is pretty quick. Yeah, a lot faster than most movies. Well, thank you guys very much thank for you. being here today. This is Elliot us. Lester and Wesley Strick. Thank you. The movie is Love is the Drug, premiering at Slam Dance. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time. You know that it is. Oh, they're fucking human! What did I do? Get up!